Hi, Paul. Hey, how are you? I'm doing fine. How are you doing? Very well. Uh, amazing. Uh, Paul Jones, everybody, is the Vice President uh, for Corporate Strategy of Paraclete Energy. And he will be talking about the polymer matrix silicon nanotechnology. We're very excited to hear what you uh, will be talking about. And um, the stage is yours. I'll be muted and camera off. Great. Well, I am delighted to be here uh, with representing Paraclete Energy, uh, a battery materials company. Uh, we don't make batteries. Uh, Paraclete makes batteries better. I should warn everyone, I, my doctorate is in law. So this will be a higher level discussion of our business and, and our, our product. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is something we are very excited about at Paraclete Energy our SM silicon 3590 silicon anode material, and in particular, it's polymer matrix architecture. We call that silicon silo. SM silicon 3590 offers a unique combination of attributes that combines disruptive energy, and then we'll spend some time talking about disruptive economics. I'm sure we're all uh, familiar with the promise of silicon as an anode material. Uh, it's truly disruptive increases in energy density are possible, at least in theory, up to an order of magnitude. And those kinds of increases in energy would obviously have a, it could translate into EV ranges measured in thousands of miles instead of hundreds, which would obviously be very disruptive in the market. But I suspect we're also familiar as well with the issues that make realizing that promise so difficult. Silicon, as a matter of physics, uh, its reality expands as much as 400% during lithiation. And then, of course, it shrinks back to the starting size, more or less, during delithiation. And that expansion then shrink cycle leads to very poor cycling performance for a battery and cycle life in, and as well as stability. So mitigating the impact of that expansion contraction cycle on battery life, recognizing that it can't be stopped, is really what makes achieving anything like the potential of silicon in a practical EV battery so difficult. And that really is what silicon silo does. It enables disruptive silicon performance in a practical product with superior economics by mitigating the problems caused by the expansion of silicon during lithiation. Okay, how do I get this to go to the next slide? I can okay. help you. Yep. There we go. Um, so how have folks been trying to solve the silicon expansion problem to date? Most of the attention and as near as we can tell, the vast majority of the funding has gone into expansion mitigation modes that are based on encasing the silicon material in a carbon shell as illustrated in this graphic. Now, I'm not going to tell you carbon shell architecture won't work. It, it, it can work, uh, but it is problematic for several reasons. First, in terms of performance, the energy density gains over graphite and even silicon oxide are modest. Most companies focused on carbon shell silicon architectures are projecting energy density gains of maybe 20 to 30 percent over that of graphite today, uh, maybe 30 to 40 percent in, in five years or more. Uh, which works out to only 15 to 25 percent over silicon oxide architectures. The limited performance is a function of how little silicon there really is in these carbon shell based silicon atom materials. Carbon shell silicon architectures typically have about 20 percent or so of this of silicon in the anode material, which means there's 80 percent inactive shell material. With so much inactive material, there just isn't enough silicon in these products to achieve disruptive performance gains. There are also some serious business model and economic problems with carbon shell architectures. They require expensive and exotic manufacturing equipment and processes and require significant quantities of silane gas, something that's available in very few places in the world. In fact, just one in the United States up in Moses Lake, Washington. Silane gas generally can't be transported any distance in commercial quantities, and a lot of the silane gas used to create these products ends up in the atmosphere. Further, the carbon shell, while it's electronically conductive, is not active and restricts ion transport, which also limits performance. Finally, most carbon